Welcome. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here tonight. And we are going to have a great time worshiping the Lord, because that's what we want to do. So let's start with a word of prayer. How about that? <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> Lord, thank you for bringing us here tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we have so many people here that have a good sense of humor. And um, Lord, I thank you that we are your children, and um, you love us. So may our worship just be loving you back. In Jesus' name, amen.
jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy And all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me Jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy And all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And we are his portion and he is our prize Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes If his grace is an ocean we're all sinking And heaven meets earth like an unforeseen kiss And my heart turns violently inside of my chest I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way
stairs to the sky And your righteousness Is like the mighty mountains yeah. Your justice flows Like the ocean tide And I will lift my high voice To worship And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness. Stretches to the sky, and your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Yeah, your justice flows like the ocean tide. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, oh to the heavens Your faithfulness stretches to the sky And your righteousness is like the mighty mountains Yeah flows like the ocean tide and I will lift my high voice to worship you my King and I will find my high strength in the shadow I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, oh Reaches to the heavens Your faithfulness Stretches to the sky Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love We thank you for your faithfulness Your righteousness Your word Bless your word tonight, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Ah, it's good to be back on Wednesday nights. I missed it. It's not, it was good to have the break, uh, but I missed it. And um, I wish more people would miss it. <laughs> I really do, because um, they don't know what they're missing. It's an oasis. It's like an oasis in the middle of it. 
you know, the desert, <laughs> the desert of this world. Father, thank you for this time back again to worship you and to study your word and to just um, see what you have for us tonight, Lord. God, we praise you. It's so good to worship you. And it's good when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Thank you. We're just thankful to be here tonight. Bless your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight's study is chapter 33, Jacob or Israel. Now, uh, we're still in that uh, section of Genesis dealing with the patriarchs, specifically now dealing with Jacob. And, you know, if Jacob had a T-shirt to wear, it would say on it, a work in progress. <laughs> because he was a real work in progress. He had spiritual ups and downs like Abraham had, like Isaac had, like we have. So remember from last time, Jacob has come back from Haran, living with his uncle Laban, and is now back in the land again, and he's getting ready to meet his brother Esau, or be reunited to his brother Esau. He's already buttered up Esau with gifts from the previous chapter, remember? But Esau doesn't know Jacob's intentions, and Jacob doesn't know Esau's intentions. And remember, when they last saw each other 20 years earlier, Esau wanted to kill Jacob. And let's read that back in chapter 27, 41. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which his father, uh, with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Nothing more premeditated than that. So, and these two twins, remember, even struggled in the womb before they were uh, born, and they were going at each other. And then even when they were born, they were competing with each other. And so now they're ready to confront one another. Jacob is also, in the previous chapter, just had a wrestling match with the Lord to where God crippled Jacob in his hip. And he's now walking with a limp, but he called that place, anybody remember? Anybody? Anybody? Peniel, Peniel, which means the face of God, because he saw the face of God. And so God is slowly, uh, well, God is slowing Jacob down. Jacob is a runner. Jacob is a conniver. But he's teaching him to rely on the Lord instead of always being on the run. But Jacob is a diehard. And he is one of those people who learns the slow way. Jacob's name has been changed from, remember, heel catcher, Yaakov, to Israel, governed by God. But we're going to see in this passage, he's still called Jacob. Meaning that he's still struggling with the flesh, with that old Jacob mentality. The conniving the struggling, the scheming Jacob. When Abram's name was changed to Abraham, he was never called Abram again. When Saul's name was changed to Paul, he was never called Saul again. When Jacob's name is changed to Israel, he's called Jacob again. So Jacob is still struggling with his old life. Is he Jacob, the heel catcher, or is he Israel, governed by God? Well, a little of both in this passage. So chapter 33, verse 1. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maid servants. So Esau is coming out with 400 men. Why? As we're going to see, Esau had a change of heart. He's no longer angry at Jacob. But perhaps when Esau heard that Jacob was coming with this large company that he was coming with, he thought that Jacob may have had hostile intentions toward him, and he wanted to be ready. Or maybe it was just a welcoming mat kind of a thing. I doubt that. But he didn't really know what Jacob was intending. 
But how sad it is when families get to the point that they can't trust each other anymore. You know? And brothers can't trust each other and sisters can't trust each other. How sad are though when the family of God can't trust one another. Uh, suing one another, bickering with each other when there really should be unity in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4 verse 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I like that. It doesn't say endeavoring to make the unity of the Spirit. It says endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. And what's implied there is if we're walking in the Spirit, there will be unity in the body of Christ. If we're not walking in the Spirit, there will be discord. Verse 2. And he put the maidservants, that was Bilhah and Zilpah, remember? He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. <laughs> so if we look at the list of all of their names, he puts the maidservants and their children first, then Leah and her children next, risking the lives of 10 of his children and his wife Leah by putting them in the lead. Are you following? They're, they're leading the procession, in other words. But Rachel and Joseph are last as far as possible out of harm's way. Joseph is the only one of the 11 that's named in this passage. So who do you think Jacob favors? Rachel and Joseph, right. Remember, Jacob only had one son by his beloved Rachel at this point, and that was Joseph. The rest are from Leah and the other two maidservants. And this, <clears throat> excuse me, this will no doubt be part of the jealousy that the rest of the boys will have later toward Joseph. Remember, they sell him into slavery and the whole works. And it must have been very painful for the family to see that they were expendable. That they're being put in the lead closer to the enemy, so to speak, uh, than uh, Rachel and Joseph. Verse 3. Then he, that is Jacob, crossed over before them. So he goes ahead of all of them. And he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. In other words, as he's approaching Esau, he bows. And then he goes further and he bows to the ground again. And he, go, and he does that for seven times until he gets to Esau. So he's acknowledging uh, Esau as the elder, greeting him as a king would be greeted, bowing down before him seven times. Even though Isaac had said to Jacob earlier, may your mother's sons bow before you. God wanted Jacob to trust God. But Jacob divides his family up and he bows before Esau seven times. Now Esau had become very wealthy by this point in time. And he had conquered the land of Seir down in the south, which was now named after him, Edom, the land of Edom. So Jacob is trying to appease his brother, but this was also a culturally acceptable thing to bow before, you know, uh, someone and, and to approach like this as well. So was Jacob trusting God or was he work, trying to work this out in fear? Yes. Yes, probably a little of both. But notice the good here. Jacob is going ahead of his family this time. Now remember, in the previous chapter, he was, the, in the, he was behind them all. He was in the rear of things. And uh, so last time, before he wrestled with God, he positioned himself last. Now, after wrestling with God, he puts himself ahead, meaning he's confronting the fear that he had that once dominated him. But Jacob is taking baby steps. He's confronting his fears, but he's taking baby steps at the same time. He is trusting God, but he's also relying on himself. He's doing a little of both. God, I trust you, but I also need to take matters into my own hands. So I'm going to separate my family out, which is typical of what we do, is it not? 
You know, God says he's going to do something in our lives, and we believe him. We say, yeah, God, I believe you. And then we take our baby steps, and we take matters into our own hands. And then we give it back, and we take matters into our own hands, and we give it back, and we do this back and forth thing. And Esau, as he approaches Jacob, and as Jacob is approaching him, remember, Jacob had wrestled with God, so he sees Jacob, what? limping. He's limping, right? And Esau probably assessed the situation that he could have easily overpowered Jacob in the group. Wow, this guy is hurt. This guy is, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, handicapped, basically. But look what happens, verse 4. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. So it's been 20 years since they've seen each other, and God has softened Esau's heart. He's still godless. That's what the Bible says. He was a godless man. But God has softened him toward his brother, and Jacob's prayer was answered. God worked in both of their hearts. In both of these, these, are, these were stubborn guys. <laughs> this was a dysfunctional family. You know, so God can work and soften the hardest of hearts, even people like Esau. He really can. So don't give up on people. Don't give up. You know, sometimes we run into people that we think, man, their hearts are hard. Uh, And you just don't ever see how they could possibly come to the Lord or have softened hearts. And don't give up on them. I remember when I was in sales, I saw God soften so many hearts. Not always to the Lord, but I saw him soften them to the Lord. But I also saw him soften the hearts of unbelievers toward one another and toward me. I I mean, I I would go into some of my accounts, or or I would cold call and go into an account, and uh, they would ask me what company I was with, and I would tell them the name of the company, and they would say, oh, we hate that company. (laughs) We don't want anything to do with that company. That company is terrible. And I would just try to remain humble before the Lord, and I would watch as God would soften their hearts toward me. I mean, God can do that if we're prayerful, if we're praying for people, if we don't give up. he He can soften any heart. And notice, they don't rehash the past. They forget what's behind, and they just embrace each other, and they weep. And you know, when we hold on to the past, it eats us alive. It eats us alive. Uh, There's resentments, there's bitterness, uh, and it's like a cancer that's just eating away at us. And that's why Paul said in Ephesians 4, verse 31, let all bitterness... Wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. If God, if Jesus forgave us, if God forgave us through Jesus Christ, wow, shouldn't we be forgiving toward one another? Be kind toward one another. The NIV says, be kind and compassionate toward one another. Verse 5, and he lifted his eyes and saw the the, the women and children and said, who are these with you? So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Verse 6, then the maidservants came near, Bilhah and Zilpah, and they and their children bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. And afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Sounds like they had received instruction from Jacob to me. Verse 8. And then Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? This, these are the gifts that Jacob had sent in advance. And Esau saying, what do you mean by all of this? And he said, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. So Esau doesn't want the gifts. He, he has 20. And Esau realized that he could be blessed also without having the birthright that Jacob stole from him. 
Notice Jacob refers to Esau as my Lord and to himself as Esau's servant. This is the opposite of what God had said. Esau calls Jacob his brother, my brother. But Jacob is still working this, you know. He's still working it in the flesh, trying to appease Esau. And I want you to notice, uh, again, uh, in this passage, Jacob is still being called Jacob, not Israel. But the good part of this is, at this point, both of these men desired reconciliation. They, they both wanted to be restored. Uh, even though they didn't trust it, they desired it. And, and I love the fact that Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? And Jacob said, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Jacob is, Esau is saying, you don't have to do all this. What's the meaning of this? But Jacob is trying to appease him. He, you know, he's trying, it's like a bribe, really. And so he's appeasing him with this performance, and he's looking to find favor. And you know, guys, we do this with the Lord. We try to appease him with our performance rather than just trust and believe. And listen, we cannot please God with our performance. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to the Lord. And we read in Romans 8, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please the Lord. And Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. Faith comes from the heart, and God looks on the heart not on the outward actions. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not what we do for God that pleases him. It's what he did for us. And if we just receive it and believe it and rest in him, oh man, God is pleased with that. And notice Esau's response. I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. You do know that God has enough, right? And I don't mean to compare Esau with God. I'm just using it as an example. God has enough. What can we give God? God has enough. He, God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything from us. Nothing. He is the God who has everything. What do you give the God who has everything? Your heart. Exactly. You give him your heart. You, you know, we can't appease him with our performance, so why do we try? Why do we keep trying to do that? And when was the last time that we had enough? Just as a side note, why do we continually strive for more? Jacob said, I have enough. Esau said, I have enough. But we say, I want more. <laughs> I need more, more money, more things, more, 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 more. Verse 10, and Jacob said, no, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God and you were pleased with me. So this is a cryptic thing from Jacob. He had seen the face of God in the last chapter, remember. And God had reassured him that all of this would work out for good. And he's seeing it taking place. So he's connecting, Jacob is connecting what's going on with Esau here to seeing the face of God. It's a connection. And, you know, I think that's true in our Christian lives too. You know, when the body of Christ helps each other, when the body of Christ is encouraging each other, when uh, Christians are reaching out to each other and lifting each other up, we are seeing the face of God. We're seeing the face of God in each other. We're seeing the hands of God in each other and the feet of God in each other and the mouth of God in each other. And so Jacob's faith is growing, but it's growing by what he sees but remember, Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. 
God wants us to trust him even in spite of what we see or don't see. The Bible says, walk by faith, not by, hello? (laughs) Sight, (laughs) there we go. Walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 11, please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So he urged him and he took it. It's a humorous scene because previously, 20 years before, Jacob and Esau were always trying to get things from each other. And now they can't give it away. Before Jacob traded a bowl of stew to get a birthright, now he's willing to give everything away. Flocks and everything. And Esau doesn't want them, which is classic, right? We always want what we can have, and when we get it, we realize we didn't need it in the first place. Verse 12, then Esau said, let us take our journey. Let us go, and I will go before you. So Esau is saying to Jacob, come on, let's go. Come on down to Seir, and we'll live down there, kind of a thing. But Jacob said to him, but Jacob, but Jacob, but Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. He had no intention of doing this. No intention of doing this. Verse 15. And Esau said, now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. Okay, great. You're going to come behind, so I'll leave some of my people with you to help out. But he said, but Jacob said, but he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. So Esau leaves and goes down to Seir. Now, Seir is the land of Edom where Esau lived. Deuteronomy tells us that God gave the land of Seir to Esau as a possession. So Jacob is saying, I will join you in Edom or Seir. However, as I said, he had no intention of doing that. He just made excuses. The children, the family, the flocks, You know, they're all, you know, kind of weak, so I'll come behind and I'll join you later. And he refused for Esau to leave anything with him because he wanted to be on his own. And so, verse 17, and Jacob journeyed to Sukkot, built himself a house, built himself a house, a permanent residence, and made booths for his livestock, and therefore, The name of the place is Sukkot. So if we look on the map, we could see Sukkot right there by Peniel, uh, which is near where he had met with Esau. So Jacob does the opposite of what he told Esau. He's still lying to him. Uh, There's still deception going on. He's separating from Esau. Mount Seir is south from where they were, but no sooner does Esau get out of sight and Jacob heads over to Sukkot, which means shelter or booths. The Feast of Tabernacles is actually the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, Temporary Tabernacles. So you see, Jacob didn't go back to Seir, and it seems he had no intention of doing so. He was just trying to get Esau to move on, and he stayed in Sukkot here probably for somewhere around eight years. Now, remember what God told him to do when he was back with Uncle Laban, and he was getting ready to leave, and he was afraid of Laban and all of that. God said to Jacob, return back to the land and go to Bethel. Go to Bethel. But he doesn't go to Bethel. He seems to be going everywhere else except Bethel. 
And everywhere else is the wrong place to be. Jacob is such a great picture of me, guys. I'll tell you what. God tells me to do something, and I do something else. Okay, Lord, and then I do something else. Paul said, the very things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those are the things I end up doing. And so this struggle that we have in this life, even after seeing the face of God, remember Jacob saw the face of God, even after seeing the face of God, even after becoming a Christian, we still struggle with that flesh. But that's Romans 7, and we also have Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But Jacob's disobedience here, he should be in Bethel, but his disobedience here is going to cause all kinds of problems. Verse 18. Then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. Does that sound familiar? He pitched his tent before the city. Do you remember Lot and Sodom? He pitched his tent before the city. Interesting. So he comes to Shechem. He's getting closer to Bethel. Kind of seems to be working on it. <laughs> but he comes to Shechem instead, and he pitches his tent there. But Shechem was not a good place. It was an idolatrous place. And Jacob doesn't go into the city, but he pitches his tent before the city like Lot did with Sodom. Shechem means ridge, but the root word comes from, and it means neck. And what's implied by that is it's a place of burden on the shoulders or on the neck. It's a burdensome place, a yoke around the neck, so to speak. Shechem was built right up against Mount Gerizim. And Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal was the place that later the Israelites are going to pronounce blessings and curses. Some of the Israelites went on Mount Ebal and pronounced the curses, and some of the Israelites went on Mount Gerizim and pronounced the blessings, and this acted like an amphitheater where they could hear each other from mountain to mountain, and they pronounced these blessings and curses. Verse 19, And he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hammer, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. And then he erected an altar there and called it El Elohi Israel. Interesting. What name does he use for himself? Israel. Interesting. He's calling himself Israel. He, know his, he knows his name has been changed. But yet the text keeps calling him Jacob. He'll catch her. And El Elohi, Elohi uh, Israel means God, the mighty God of Israel. So he erects this altar and he declares God that he's the mighty God of Israel. He uses his new name, but he's still Jacob here. And that's because he's not where God told him to go. He's not where God wants him to be, and that is in Bethel. And so he builds this altar, and what's implied is he's making sacrifices to the Lord. Jacob is substituting sacrifice for obedience. Instead of being obedient to the Lord, he sacrifices to him, as he did with Esau in order to appease Esau. He's trying to appease the Lord. But the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. This is what Jesus confronted the Pharisees on, guys. The Pharisees were experts in sacrifice. If anybody knew how to sacrifice, it was the Pharisees. They sacrificed everything. They had this outward sacrifice of a life, but in their hearts, they were disobedient to God. And Jesus called them out. Now, while at Shechem, Jacob digs a well, 
as they did in those days for water. And this is the same well that Jesus comes to and meets a Samaritan woman in Samaria. This is the area of Samaria. And he talks about the living water of the soul with the Samaritan woman. So this is the area that came to be known as Samaria. So Jacob is getting close to the house of God, to Bethel, but he's not there yet. And while he's at Shechem, we're going to see in the next chapter, Dinah, the sister of the boys, the sister of uh, the 11 sons of Jacob, Dinah, she gets violated by the Shechemites. And the Israelite boys take matters into their own hands, and man, it turns into a mess. And we're going to deal with that in the next chapter. All because Jacob is in Shechem, the place of burden, instead of the house of God, Bethel. I don't have to spell out the application there. It's pretty obvious. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight, Lord. And for these lessons that we can get out of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, so many lessons for us, Lord. God, help us just to trust you. Help us to believe you. When, when, you, when you tell us that you want to do something in our lives, help us to trust that and just believe it and follow you. Follow your spirit. Walk in the spirit. Walk by faith, not by sight. Help us, Lord, to not take mat. Help us not to learn the slow way, mm. but the quick way. We want to be fast learners, Lord. So soften our hearts. Help us to dig up the fallow ground and help us to walk with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand in the path I see. I look to love that's unfailing. I look to grace that is all I need. Oh, call, call upon the name Jesus Christ. The stands on You'll never fail.
strong through every trial, faithful through the night. Our God will never fail. Our God will never fail. Anchor through the flood, you keep holding on. I know you'll never fail. Jesus, you'll never fail. Oh, call, call upon the name Jesus Christ, the only name that saves. Oh, call, oh, call, call upon the name Jesus Christ, the only